I got to meet Pastor Mike's little girl, and she wasn't so little. She, you know, was a student, and just got to meet her, just talk with her. And you, you know, you can tell a lot about a person by their children, right? And uh, your kids represent Pastor, and, and you too, Mike. <laughs> no, no, no. Really, I honor you, I, and I want you guys to both know this. I, I, I deeply, deeply value you two as individuals. Nobody knows. You know what I mean? They don't know. They don't know the tears. They don't know the frustration. Um, they don't know, you know, kind of the halfway between the services. Don't say that. You know, don't say that again. Uh, all those kinds of things. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they're offended. You know, or you're, you know, it's going to be good. But also the encouragement, the support. Uh, man, nobody, nobody will ever know. And I just, let, me just, let me just say this. Nobody will ever know. Two reasons why. One, they don't get to. Um, the... I think most of our minds would just explode if we knew what pastors went through and the things they do. Um, other reason is, you know, they don't get to, uh, they're not supposed to. You know, you're the pastor, and they will never know the things, the darts that you take, the hard decisions that you make, and things that you have to walk through. So I honor you. Um, Rome is a very different place because of you. Uh, the church, the local church, is the hope of the world. And I know there's some great churches around here, but man, I honor you guys. Come on. My favorite, my favorite church in all of Georgia is right here. I'm serious. So I'm Pastor Mike Goolsbay. Um, I am known for a lot of reasons. One is I didn't want to be a pastor. In fact, I don't think you should ever want to be a pastor. In fact, I think you are a fool and you have a brick for a brain and a pinhole for an eye if you think there's something that... Can I just... Am I, we good? I mean, if, I'm, I'm telling you. Um, it's the hardest thing in the world. It's the hardest job in the world. The hurts and the things they have to walk through, but at the same time, it's like being in the front seat of a roller coaster. You know, the clown's mouth's going to eat you, but all of a sudden you come out the other side. It's terrifying, but you, you can't wait to get back in line. You know, in that front seat of the roller coaster, you can see a lot of things like life change. Oof. Oof. I mean, I, I have natural kids. Oh, I have spiritual kids, too. And the heart and the opportunity to see them grow. And today's not about me. Today's about you and your influence and the calling that's on your life. God has called you. Some of us, God called us through our mamas. You know, son, you can go easy. You can go hard. Jesus is going to get a hold of you. <laughs> yeah, don't ever thumb that one. You know, some of us got a calling at a gift, you know, at a summer camp. But really what we were trying to call was the girl next to us and get her phone number. Hey, what's up, baby? You get Jesus tonight? Mm. <laughs> oh, you know what? <laughs> I forgot my phone number. Can I have yours? Did it hurt? You know, when you fell from heaven. <laughs> Some of us, we got our, our calling because our lives are filled with trap doors and locked doors. And God just seems to make sure that he takes us. We're going to go. I, I love Sundays. I love church. There's no place, listen to me, there's no place that can bring lasting change to a community, except for the church. Not policies, not government entities. We've got to have rules. You know, politics are a burden, necessity, I understand. Uh, but man, let me tell you, nothing can bring lasting change to a community like a church. So church for me has is, is changed over, over the last 13 years that I was pastoring. And one of the things for me is, um, this is what is my favorite meal of the week. This is, this is after service on Sundays. Uh, this is my family sitting around whatever restaurant. And by the way, we destroy it. Whatever restaurant, we destroy it. We ruin everybody's experience. I have six grandkids, and the oldest one just turned three. Just to give you an idea. They are absolute delights to me. But everybody, did you know if they're your grandkids, their cry is not as loud and it's not as terrifying and it doesn't bother you near as much. 
Other kids, you need to get your kids quiet because they're bothering me. But my kids, <laughs> when they cry, they're like angels singing. Um, this is my daughter who, by the time we were having lunch at the bottom right-hand corner, she's had it. <laughs> right? And I remind her that the babies around this table are God's reward for me for not ending them earlier in their life. <laughs> and so you get this if you're a grandparent. I'd be such a better parent now than I ever was then. But I'm not supposed to be. That's little Charlie Renee. And the young lady in the middle is the hottest grandma in the world. She is traffic stopping gorgeous. Uh, I, mean, I mean it. I mean it. And, you know, everybody's like, <laughs> when she, are these your kids? She's like, no, these are my grandkids. No, really? Uh, oh, well, he's obviously a granddad. But you, wow, you're amazing. <laughs> and our Latingos aren't even here. We have four Latingos, half Latin, half gringo. We have a Colombian daughter. Um, anyway, you can see my son at the end, far right of the table, and his wife, Danielle. He's looking at me like, you know what he's thinking? He's like, I've seen the pictures of you when you were 23, Dad, and you look just like me. Dear God, dear God, it's inevitable, isn't it? It's the Ghoul's Bay curse. All right, and then a couple grandkids. Cade, with his hat backwards, is my oldest grandson. He's a living sermon illustration. Uh, I could preach about anything just with him. 30 minutes to myself. Uh, and then there's Charlie. He's our youth pastor. He and Jamie at the bottom right-hand corner. Charlie's just sitting here thinking, oh, no, oh, no. I got my plate before I made one of my grandkids or his son and his wife has been waiting on him to help with the kids. And he's like, I am in so much trouble. I got food for myself first. So, yeah, you know how that is, right? After we eat, we go to our yard. We live in the country. We go to the yard, and it's strip the babies naked and feed them ice cream and take pictures of how nasty they can get. Uh, it's such a great exercise. Uh, they, the kids, their, their mood instantly declines. They, they, they go into a sugar coma. Uh, I used to think my granddad was really tired or sickly, you know, because he always leave for a nap. He was hiding. You know, I'm in my room playing Angry Birds for 15 minutes just to catch my breath because these guys are wearing me out. Um, but so that's a little bit of my life and my family. Um, I'm going to be real transparent with you guys today because I want you to know something. The summation of a church is really the commitment of its people. Yes, a leader gives. Yes, a leader brings vision and direction. But I can tell you from hanging out with people like Brian Houston, when it comes to huge churches, when it comes to people of, of great church, you know, the, the staff at the Church of the Highlands, you know, the largest churches in the world, even somebody like Craig Rochelle, and who's now has the largest church in America, uh, you know, all these people, I can tell you one thing. Their success was not just theirs. Right? They, they get credit, but they also get the curse. You see, it's about the people. There'll be, there'll be somebody in every church that will have an opportunity to get a download from God, to lift up their pastor's hands, and to see something where there's a need. You know, creative ways, if you ever want to just be a, a blessing to your pastor, a couple things. Communicate the detail of the miracle and what the local church is doing. Not to give him credit, but listen, we hear the junk, right? I mean, we, we, we hear as pastors, we, we know the ugly. Uh, in fact, sometimes we come under attack. And you know what? We don't get to do anything. In fact, I tell pastors that I'm friends with, ones that I oversee, ones that you know, have, have inspired me, ones that are encouraging them. I tell them one thing, don't attack, don't defend. What am I supposed to do? Go squish. Die like a freaking pastor. You know, see, you get to be a worm, not a snake. What does a snake do if you step on it? Oh, it'll bite you. What does a worm do if you step on it? It goes, <laughs> right? Right? Well, we're called to be what? Fishers of men. Um, last time I checked, fish don't like snakes. And we, we don't get to, and, and, and God's grace is there. And God's grace is absolutely there. But the power to transform a community, the power to influence comes from you. Not your agenda. Because something happens when you get behind a leader's vision. You're not always going to understand it. It's not always going to be one of those ones where it's like, aha. 
In fact, sometimes as a leader, I'm only able to give pieces in, in real time. I mean, you guys just came through a phenomenal 21 days. I mean, there are people who were here for all 21 days. Last time we did 21 days of prayer, I had to miss two days. I mean, it, it's, and for me, I'm just blown away at the, at the commitment you guys have. Jesus said, my house will be a house of prayer. I can attest to the fact, I believe this house, Pastor, is a house of prayer. Amen. Pastors Mike and Kim, amen? But you go through these monumental things. Let me tell you something. Yay, we prayed for 21 days. Woo-hoo. You know, what happens when you pray? Ah, kids pick up after themselves. Their homework's done, right? Dogs don't poop on the carpet. Everything just comes together. Bills get paid. There's no challenges. Neighbors are quiet. No, when you, when you, when you make a commitment, how many guys know the devil hates it? I mean, he hates it. And whenever you make any kind of commitment, it comes with resistance. That's why the God, God promises prosperity, blessings, a biblical version. We sometimes misinterpret but have this blessing as our soul prospers, but that we are blessed with persecution, increase with persecution. You know, if you've ever, I kid you not, Mikey, my son, there'd be days like, oh, Dad, my knees hurt. And he would be a quarter of an inch taller in two days. And he had these massive growth spurts. And when we, when we think about all these things, we, we think about the growth in the life of a church. The, the message in a bottle for, for first service was invite somebody. Invite somebody to church. And, and I think there's people here that you need to invite somebody. Because I've walked down some of the streets of Rome. I have. And not for any credit, mostly for my own curiosity. I, I've, I've talked to absolute strangers. And I, and I asked them, do you go to church? Would you go to church more if what? Most people said, and some of them were even surprised, you know, I don't know why I don't go to church. I've never been asked. I mean, that is a reality. I mean, why is it that we can take such radical positions in areas of arena, places of entertainment, or even for our own selfish curiosity? But man, we can't walk across the room and shake hands or invite a coworker. Is it somehow we have a different world than we do weekdays? No, in fact, we're all broken. We, we all have to a certain degree. Right? And I didn't do as well as I hoped to, but I communicate that we all have to some degree that, you know, this desire and so to invite. But today I, I want to share with you, not just inviting somebody, but we talk about you, to you about investing. About investing. Because things that you invest in take time. It takes seed. And make no mistake, the attribute that God honors most in any believer is faithfulness. And faithfulness cannot be established at a moment or a whim. It's consistency. All right. I have set a record for church. Desi Church, Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, was in Charisma Magazine before I was the pastor as the fastest growing church in America. And then I became pastor. <laughs> I knew you had Gideon's revival. This was a strike. This was a flat, full-on walkout. My first weekend as a pastor, more than 500 people walked out of service. I'm not talking they, they like whispered and ex ex you know, just exited quietly at the end of the message while everybody's receiving Jesus. No, I'm talking about they were just done. And they just had had enough. And I took it very, very personally. We were absolutely bankrupt. Millions and millions and millions of dollars in upside down, ugly, nasty debt. I had one fear. Well, I have a couple fears. Expired milk. <laughs> clowns. Do you have a clown ministry? Clowns are from the pit of hell, okay? <laughs> What kind of person dresses up and plays with children? <laughs> Walmart, I think, is like the other, other hell, right? If, if you've been bad, right, and you, and you don't quite deserve, you know, your eternal perpetuity and damnation and punishment, then somehow, you know, you get to go to Walmart for your wife to get something. 
And those three things, right? How hard can it be to remember three things? I always forget one, but get cookies too, right? Can I get a witness? Can I get a witness? Okay, you guys understand what I'm saying. But this was one of the most horrible moments in my life. I'd been extremely successful as a youth pastor. In one year, I had over 10,000 first-time visitors. An unbelievable number of salvations. But youth ministry at the church I was at was like having a rich poppy. Like having a rich dad. If I asked long enough and begged long enough, somehow it would show up. All of a sudden, there's a church that's in the trash can. And there was no other option. I became pastor. I inherited three lawsuits. I would be named on two more. My biggest fear, next to clowns, expired milk, Walmart, right, in ministry was to be in a lawsuit. To somehow have my name on a permanent documentation. None of them were criminal. They were all civil. But it was just hurt believers wanting to hurt people. And my name got thrown into it. Some of them vicariously because I took over the church that was so hurt. But I watched something. I watched the people walk out. And for a moment... I forgot the people that stayed. One week I told the church, I just had enough. Just had enough. I said, listen, if you're here today and you are a gossip, repent. Repent. You're destroying something that is not yours. And if you can't repent, leave. Don't come back. Take your poison and your bitterness someplace else. And next week, attendance was even worse. I'm like, what happened this week? Renee's like, I'm pretty sure you did. <laughs> There's a moment where our kids are beautiful, right? All babies are not beautiful. Let me just get it out there. Right? One of my kids came with one of the most warped looking heads. I begged the doctor, and they reassured me it would go back to normal. People are like, what a cute baby. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I mean, they get, like, really cute when they're a couple months old. But babies are just, like, you know, when they can recognize you, it's really fun. But there's times where we just, like, oh, my kids are perfect. And those are such great times, right? In fact, we make them stand still and take a picture. There's a moment where everything is as it should be. There's times we break our heart. First time my daughter hurt my feelings, she was three. I mean, she, she, like, I mean, she hurt my puppy heart feelings in the ugliest ways. Um... You know, Mikey, he's like, Dad, you know you're not cool. I'm pretty sure I am. No, Dad, you're embarrassing me. Yeah, I don't care. I mean, when it comes to my son, you know what? Hey, buddy, someday you can have children. You can screw them up however you want. In the meantime, yeehaw, here we go. When Jamie was four, when Jamie was four, no kidding, she said, Dad, I don't want you to drop me off at school anymore. You embarrass me. I don't want to be seen with you. No, wait, hold on here, hold on. You want ice cream? You better show me some love after school and I better be a rock star. <laughs> it's hard to be a parent. It's hard to be a believer. But do you remember what it was like before you had a relationship with Jesus? Oh, come on, somebody. I know, I know what it's like to wake up and know that my life eternally is not going to be good. I know what it's like to live in the fear and the trepidation and absolute terror, but somehow mitigate it and cover it up with either arrogance or foolishness or just, just raw stupidity. I know what it's like to be in trouble, and I mean a lot of trouble, because it was my fault, because I was the one who had gotten in trouble. Got in trouble with the police, broke my mom's heart, I'd gotten into a place where all of a sudden I'd do an unreal amount of community service. Because of the crime that I'd been charged with, they, nobody wanted anything to do with me. Nobody wanted to do with me. They're like hands out, on, stiff arm. And when I walked to this one church, hey, listen, I was wearing flip-flops. I learned they're not called thongs anymore. I was just wearing thongs. <laughs> and I walked to this church. I said, I... I I said, will you help me? The stiff arms turned into a big hug. And they took me and my flip-flops and let me weed eat a parking lot And for weeks. And you know, later on, when my dad fired me for the second time, he's like, what do you want to do? I was like, 
they don't know what to do. He's like, find something you're good at. Find something you love. Dad, the only thing I ever loved was the community service I had to do for the church if I ever wanted to have a license again. He's like, start there. So I started there. I cleaned toilets. Um, I went to Bible school. I wanted to preach so bad. I went to the youth pastor and started volunteering because as creepy as it sounds, I was really in love with one of the youth. It was the 80s. I guarantee that'll never happen here. If you're like, hey, I'm in love with the youth. Can I volunteer? Um, just don't even turn in the, the application. In fact, just go see Pastor Mike, right? He's, hey, he has a ministry <laughs> that he wants to put all over you. And in that moment, so I, I, I got to like stack chairs. I got to set things up. I took great joy in making sure the chairs were straight and setting up the sound system and the little bitty light system. And just took great joy of people walking into something that was prepared for it. Loved it, loved it. I have a speech impediment. Um, I have a neural condition that causes a restriction of my vocal cords that I have to do a speech exercise. And if you, if you ever know it, I kind of stammer and I have difficulties you know, completing the sentence. But worst of all, I sound like Kermit the Frog because of the spasms you know, in my vocal cords. I'm not a gifted natural speaker. I'm just a passionate believer in Jesus. I wanted so bad to preach. I asked the youth pastor, I want to preach. He said, every seventh and eighth grader is demon possessed. <laughs> he says, I hate every one of them. He says, if you want them, they're yours. Take them. I taught terrible messages that they would remember and parents would quiz me about later. But I used my gift in a place where it was an opportunity. Oh, I scrubbed every toilet. 122 toilets were in that church. I know, I counted them. And let me, let me just settle a myth. Ladies, you are more nasty than men. I'm sorry I said that, Pastor. I think I just upset half your congregation. I'm so sorry. So, in this, in this journey, and here's, all this is coming to a point. I just, in one story, one testimony, one, please, I, I want you to take your next step. Not for me, of course for your church. Of course for the kingdom, but, but from a dad, a crazy uncle, a brother, a dad, granddad, whatever, 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 okay? Take the next step. Take the next step. Next step of service, next step of faithfulness, the next step of giving. One of the definitions of poverty is to have nothing to give or to choose, choose to do nothing when you have a chance to give. To have nothing to give or to choose to do nothing. Yeah, a dollar makes a difference. It makes a difference in the kingdom of God. Yes, a dollar makes a difference when it comes to acts of faith. Yes, a dollar is enough in some ways to actually win somebody to Jesus. Because the gospel is free, but it takes money to get there. You see, a dollar is just a dollar. It's just a tool. But when a bunch of dollars come together, you can do far more together than you have to do apart. Well, you know, I just like to see where the money goes. Well, how's it working for you? You see, when I put something in the offering, I'm making an investment in eternity. I'm making room for God to put something better in there. All right? I mean, I tithe. Yeah, you better believe it. But I don't tithe on what I make. I hope somebody grabs hold of this. I tithe on what I want to make. That's my heart. Yeah, but that's 10%. Come on. Let me look at your checkbook. I'll help you find some place. You see, when we invest in something, and that's my heart for you, it's good for you. It's good for you. It's good for you to give something away. It's good for you. God moves in in a place where you let something move out. And I promise you this, God will never ask you for something that he doesn't have something better. I told a story about Cade first service, the quicker summation of that. Cade, the living illustration, um, if you come to my house, Cade will take you to the pantry and he'll give you raisins. Raisins aren't the best snack in the pantry. I'm a popsy. I've worked long and I've worked hard to be able to give my grandkids any stinking thing they want. As long as it's not going to make them sick, as long as it's not going to hurt them. But, oh yeah, I get to be that guy. I mean, I know where the ice cream is hidden from their grandma. Please don't tell her I said that, dear God. Because the beautiful woman, she can be scary. I, I, 
Ted had put some raisins in front of Cade one day, and I just thought, you know, he enjoys them so much. He loves them. I'm like, Cade, can I have a raisin? And, and here's a long story short, and, and you can listen to the first service later maybe. But I said, here's a long story short. He's like, Cade, can I have a raisin? No. Cade, I'm the one that gave you the raisins. Can I have a, can I give Pop a raisin? <laughs> no. I remember thinking, you little turd. <laughs> so I took him away from him. Oh, he cried. Oh, he cried. Not give me a raisin? Guess what? These are Popsy's raisins. If you've ever gotten into it with a three-year-old, you lose every time. I mean, if you have to debate, right, because you really want them to get it. It's okay. Finally, I got some raisins out. And he shared something. My wife, for whatever reason, has this giant container of raisins. I said, Kate, I want you to know something. Popsy has all the raisins you could ever want in your life. He's like, oh. I was like, buddy, here you go. So he, he'll reach in there. His hands will be dirty. They'll be sticky. And he'll reach in and he'll grab you a raisin. Because he's learned when he gives what little he has. Oh, come on, somebody. Popsy got some real junk food. We're not playing with the raisins anymore. All my grandkids eat raisins. Imagine six grandkids eating raisins, and we wonder where the grapes in the trash can come from. Okay, let's talk. When we give what God has given us, we make room for something better. I had this broken auditorium, a broken staff, broken people. I needed $2.3 million to survive a single week. I honestly can't tell you how we did. But I know the first thing we did as a church was tithe. Because I remember thinking, we're going to die. <laughs> but we're going to die with seed in the ground. And I don't believe in the curse, some evil, terrible thing happening. Um, if you don't tithe, if, I just think it's just real sad for people that don't know how to be generous. Because something is eternal. Only the moment that it was mine, and I give it on behalf of God. And I want to have a lot when I get to heaven. So it's easy for me to give things away. So easy. But when we invest, when we invite, we expand our world bigger than our own. And most of us live with such a small reality that we forget the enormity of God. And so today, I want to read you a passage because I think this is a prophetic word. This is a word that God gave me specifically for you. Jerusalem, Zion, and your Bibles represent the fulfillment of God's promises. It also represents the place of worship. Did you hear me? We're going to read a passage, a prophetic word I believe for you, that is about a place of worship. About when people come here, what they're going to experience. And about the restoration, not just of natural wealth, but of health. And the restoration of what only God can do. So here's this passage. Psalms 126, when the Lord brought us back, his exiles, to Jerusalem. That's like saying when God brought his people back to church, it was like a dream. We were filled with laughter, and we sang for joy. And other nations said, what amazing things the Lord has done for them. Yes, the Lord has done amazing things for us. What joy. Restore our futures, future, fortunes, Lord as streams are near the deserts. And here's my prayer for you, okay? Those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. They weep as they go out to plant their seed, but they sing as they return with the harvest. Church is not a simple, right, easy thing to do, but it's fantastic. The person who shook your hand today, there's anointing on them that there was a presence that was shared with you. Your gifts, your talents, your anointing that is unique to you becomes part of a beautiful color wheel. That this building that was a building, the moment that you came in together, it became a house of worship. It became this place where people who are exiled come back to God. And if you've ever seen somebody come to Jesus, listen, I've done bad things. I put things in my body that shouldn't have been there. And nothing compares to the un, 
yielding fulfillment of seeing somebody give their life to Jesus. I'm not proud of my mistakes. I'm thankful that God uses them as a tool. I haven't always been saved. I mean, there was one day when, man, the guy just, he, it was just off. I'd been traveling for, for 40 hours and had been busy, hadn't really, hadn't even got to lay down, right? I don't know if you noticed, but I'm not really made for coach class at American Airlines. I mean, I'm like a sumo wrestler and an NBA basketball player had a baby. And so I got off this plane and I'm just irritated. I smell like a river. I finally go to get my car and I'm walking, I guess, the wrong way because a guy pulls up and bumps my leg just a little bit and honks. And he's a worker. He's like, hey, idiot, you got to go to the booth first before you go to your car. And man, I don't know if you've ever had that moment where it's not good to touch someone, right? It wasn't a good time to touch me. And I went into this booth, apparently I was supposed to do this. This guy walked in. I just looked at this guy and said, hey, you know what? Don't honk at people. And I would encourage you to never, ever take one of your vehicles and come in contact with a human person intentionally. He's like, so you know what he said to me? I'm going to feel like I've been to therapy after sharing this story with you. So you know what he said to me? Well, guess what? I guess I should have just let you keep going and walking until you were lost and never came back. So how about next time I just let you go instead of helping you? I said this, how about next time you honk at me, I pull you out of the car, and I get the biggest can, and I'm going to open it on you. That was Friday <laughs> at Atlanta. <laughs> Pay less car rental. They did nothing for me. But the difference was, as soon as I said that, I'm like, I'm sorry. Would you forgive me? I just made a mistake. I meant to say really big can't. No. <laughs> but Jesus was right there. He's like, hey, hey, that's not you. That's not who you are anymore. Right? You're not a brawler. You're not that guy. Don't do that. Don't, don't leave that. Because you know he's going to figure out who I am. I've checked both services. He doesn't go to church here. Yes. No offense. I want everybody to come here and get saved, but not this dude. Not this weekend. Next weekend, absolutely. <laughs> your tears are your investment. Your tears can also be things that have been stolen. They can also be the wounds of others. God says in his word that he keeps our tears as intercession ever before him. Tears and laughter are God's way of letting us communicate things that we have no words for. You can't put into words the senses and the feelings of a tear. You can't put into words the power of laughter and the healing that it brings. God does. And I want to encourage you in so many ways. When you make an investment, you are taking part of you, your time, your resources, your talent. I, I have a few talents. Some of them I think are more noteworthy than other people seem to think. Um, I can do weird math. I, like, if you say, add up all the numbers between 1 and 100, 5,050. Somebody showed me how to do it a long time ago, and I can do that with any number. Tell me any number, and I can tell you in the next 30 seconds. Well, I don't, it's weird. Right? Ask me about algebra. Not going to happen. Uh, I learned that there's different talents that I have. Communicating is not naturally one of them, but here's what I learned. The faithfulness of God can make up the difference. A person who invests, God always honors. God always rewards. Yes, we recognize. And yes, there's those moments where God asks us to sacrifice. But God has never asked us to sacrifice something that he didn't have something better. Because what happens is we invest in the lives of other people, shaking hands, serving in the classroom, volunteering at the worship team, the prayer team, all those areas, the parking lot, the hospitality, every area. And of course, I forgot to mention like five of them, their feelings are hurt. But that means you're really special if I didn't mention you. It means that you somehow are making an investment that only God can see, and I didn't pick up today off the top of my head. But when you make that investment, you prepare a way for something radical, something better, something beyond what you ever thought. But you don't always get to find this. I worked, worked with Oral Roberts University during the transition. I was talking to their, in the Board of Regents room, and they're like, Pastor Mike, after a big personality transition, is there hope for an organization? I said, oh, you better believe it. You better believe it. 
It takes fear of God and humility. The two keys in Scripture to gaining everything. Pastor Mike, well, we've been praying for this, this, and this, and this. Listen, you would have to know the people at this table that makes this just such a ridiculous moment. Pastor Mike, tell us, I said, I'll tell you right now, God will not answer. And I'll tell you the same thing. Today. God will not answer your every prayer. He will answer you in the way that you want him to answer you. He will answer you and give you what you want. Why? Because sometimes he has something better. And sometimes, just like Kay, you just have to graduate from the silly little raisins to recognize when he stewards that, oh, Popsy's the man, right? He doesn't have to check with Grandma if she's not looking or listening and is absolutely in the other room. <laughs> I mean, it's that thing where he understands, like, you have something better for me. And you know what it's become? He's like, he can't wait to see what I give him next. He, it's contagious to see how he just... You know, how he just, whatever it is, his favorite toy, you now he brings it to me. What the, <laughs> what's coming? You know, what's coming? And those things are, are simple, but we all have that. You see, when you let go of something in your life, in the service of what is the most beautiful, lasting, and no entity, no government can bring a lasting change to human life like the church. The church is the only thing that can. Then you get it. And here's where it gets messy. The simplest of service are the most profound in creating life change. I understand we can all pray and have you know incredible miracle moments. Oh, but make no mistake, it's the moment after the service on Sunday where the preparation began behind the scenes, the planning, the different pieces, the logistics, the facility, all those things. That's where the magic happens. I, I, I'm pretty sure that there's somebody in here that you're like the shrimp on Finding Nemo. You, you woke up wanting to clean something. I mean, it's that, that whole thing. When I graduated to janitor school, I took great pride in the lines in the carpet. In fact, if I didn't like them, I had a special rake. Now, that may mean I need to be medicated. <laughs> Going back, and this is just one piece of the story, but I want to invite you into one. Right? You know this church. You know your pastors. If you're here for the first time, welcome home. Come on, somebody. We'll get the probes and the snakes and the Kool-Aid out here in just a minute and have real church. No. No, it's about family. It's about a home. So, youth ministry was easy. Then I became a pastor. Shared in first service about motorcycle accident. But let me tell you what I got to do a month ago. I got to raise up a young man from the age he was 13, he's now 33. And I handed him the keys to the church. I think about the first year that I pastored. I think about daylight savings, how before our phones would update, right? I came to service early, and there were five people there. Five people. I thought, that's it. I killed it only to realize I hadn't fixed my clock. You know how hard it is to preach to that? Because I looked for so long at the empty, and I started to see the full. And I started to say, there's a talent right there. There's a gift right there. There's an anointing. There's a, I'm not sure what you're called to do, but there's something. We're going to work on it. We're going to find it. And sometimes those are the most incredible. I'm not pointing to anyone. But you understand the heart. So I got to watch God show up. And with people's investment, a dollar here, a handshake there, we've led thousands of people to Jesus. That summer, that, that time when we, when, we, when we had the five people, I thought, for church, we had 3,000 people at Easter. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Freaked me out, though, because Super Bowl Sunday was before that, and it was, why? Let's just all meet, right, in the back classroom. This is, this is crazy. But it's, it's just one of those things where through time, I got to give something healthy. And I got to set a pastor up who doesn't know lawsuits, who doesn't, who doesn't know I had a wrongful death. Imagine, imagine somebody died on the church property and they blamed you. And their family is so bitter. And they blamed you. I mean, and you inherited that. I mean, what in the world are we thinking 
by investing in something that we can't see in hopes that somebody might respond, taking money that we could buy Starbucks or do whatever we want to with it or buy something more significant. What are we doing? We're creating the opportunity for the impossible, to love the unlovable, to reach the unreachable, and the power of God to do the impossible. It just need, he just needs permission. And when you serve other people, you give God permission to minister to you. When you invest in the gospel, you give God the opportunity. And so I handed to this young man, and I've made him cry in more countries and in more ways than I've ever made anybody else cry. I've made him cry more than my own children. I just decided to be mean to him. And if he stuck around, then he was legit. And he did. And so at 33 years old, I'm like, Jonathan, here you go. Take it. You're the lead pastor now. And they got to watch it transfer. Now, I'm still the poppy of the house. I'm still dad. But he's driving the machine. If you are faithful with the small things, God can't not not keep his word. He has to. And it's life-changing. And it'll change you forever. And I promise you this. We will all be really surprised when we get to heaven. So here's what I want. Take a step. And I'll tell you this, people can't read your mind when it comes to desire. Well, I've been wanting to do this all this time. Who'd you tell? Nobody. I was expecting the Holy Spirit to tell them. Mm -mm. No. You need to communicate if you have a desire. If you feel tired, take a second and let God show you what all you've really done. If you feel bitter, forgive and let that hurt become a seed that can be sown, that can be turned into a song of joy and a harvest of righteousness. And I just want you to, I just want you to take a step. A couple things you can do to encourage your pastor. You ready? Pretend it was me. Something I could never say from my own pulpit. Here's a couple things. One, pray for me. It's appropriate for a pastor to ask for people's prayer. But I mean every day. In fact, I would give, it, I'd give you a challenge. Every time your family prays together with a meal, pray for Pastor Mike and Kim. I mean, it's a discipline, right? Pastor, God gave me a word over this chili relano. <laughs> Another way to encourage your pastor, okay, is to listen. If he so much as says, there's a spot on the wall that bothers me, what can you do to fix that? If you really just want to get crazy, there is an anointing that is drawn when people crowd the front. If somebody were to walk in to the service right now, how easy would it be for them to get to a chair? I don't know, but I'll tell you this, it blesses a pastor. Why? Because proximity generates an anointing. Proximity is an expectation. Proximity is a representation. I just, you wanna be creative? I'm just telling you, crowd the front. Just, just try it. Preaching's great. I, I, I've heard it. I know it. It's, it's incredible. It's heartfelt. It is inspired. It's doctrinally correct. It's passionate. It's selfless. Man, you want it to get better? Get closer. And if not, just get spit on. Father, you're so good to us. Father, you love us. You love us just the way you are. Father, we want to take the next step. Not out of recklessness, not out of somehow self-defined, man-inspired. God, we want to take the next step to your promise. And Father, we will not be selfish and take it on our own. God, you put somebody in our heart during the service that we can invite to church. God, you've already begun to work. Father, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, Father, show us how to invest, how to invite your people. God, we bless our pastors. Father, thank you for pastors Mike and Kim. God, we have no idea what they go through, but Father, at the same time, we know the grace is there and we're thankful. We thank you for the staff pastors. Father, we thank you for the volunteers. God, we thank you that you're doing something amazing, God, that even the spirit, Father, that you're dividing and separating and making a path. Father, 
I pray Isaiah 43, 19, God, today's a new day. It's a new thing. Father, it's a sense. It's a feeling. It's a known thing. God, thank you that you will, like that verse says, like your word says, God, that you are doing a new thing. You're bringing springs to the wilderness and, Father, rivers to the dry lands. God, thank you for flooding this community. God, it will be said among the nations. God, thank you for your love. Thank you for your passion. Thank you for your purpose. God, as we all take that next step. If you're here today and you're like, okay, you know what? God moved in my heart today. And, and you're ready to just, just say, okay, God, as an act of obedience, okay, I'll take that next step. Just out loud. Loud enough so you can hear yourself. Maybe a couple other people can too. If you're in that place and God say, hey, listen, trust me, take that next step. Out loud, say, I will.